Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on elementary abstract algebra, undergraduate abstract algebra. This particular lecture is on lattice diagrams of subgroups of a group, and it's based on section 9.1 of my book, Algebra in Action, A Course in Groups, Rings, and Fields. So let's get started. Um, a group, as we have been discussing in previous lectures, is just a set with one operation, and that operation is closed associative. There's an identity, and every element has inverses. That's all there is to a group. As such, every information that you might want about a group is, is in its multiplication table. If you know the multiplication table and you're patient enough, you should be able to find all the information about the group because they're, they're, all there is to the group is that op one operation. However, that's a super inefficient way of getting information about a group, especially if a group has many elements uh, that multiplication table is not organized in a way that's easy to glean information from it. Um, and, and that's what group theory is about. It's about trying to figure out alternative ways of just brute force going into the multiplication table and trying to figure out things about a group. In particular, instead of focusing on elements and how they interact with other elements, we focus on structures within the group G. And, and, and that's why we focus on subgroups. We try to translate every question that we have about a group to a question about subgroups. A subgroup is a group within the group with the same operation. And, and, those, uh, and that structure tells us a lot about the group. For example, instead of asking is G abelian or not, as I have mentioned many times before, mathematicians don't like questions whose answers are binary, but rather try to, if they can, sometimes, uh, we don't know quite how to, but if we can, we try to uh, tra change the question to a question where the answer is a range of answers. And, and usually in algebra, what you do is you attach a structure uh, to that question so that this, the, the, the complexity or the size of that structure um, gives you a range of answers instead of yes, no is geobelian. And so instead of that, we, we, we ask the question, what is the center of G? The center of G, if, it's, if the whole group tells us that the group is abelian, the center consists of all the elements that commute with everything. And, and if it's not, then we know that the group is not abelian. But, but more than that, we know we have a sense of how far from are we from being abelian. Instead of, uh, and then to decide whether or not what the center is, we might be asking, is this element in the center or not? Again, a binary question that we don't like that much. So instead, we might ask, what is the centralizer of that element? The centralizer of an element is all the elements that commute with that element. And, and, and again, that gives us a sense of how far this element is from being in the center. Now, the point about the center and the centralizer is that both are subgroups and they all, they, and therefore they can be analyzed just like the original group uh, could have been or, 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 or analyzed. Also, we have theorems like Lagrange's theorem that put restrictions on what things can be subgroups and things like Silo's theorem that tell us that certain kinds of subgroups exist. And so those, those are telling us again about the subgroup structure of the group. And, and knowing more than just one subgroup or focusing on this one subgroup that's gonna answer that question, if we can look at, um, how the subgroups interact with each other, where they're sitting and so forth in the group can even be even more helpful. Now, ideally, um, we would have all the subgroups of a group. Now that doesn't, and uh, in, in often we don't have that. And, and in the next lecture, we talk about partial lattice diagrams where we have partial information. But for today, for this lecture, we are going to see what does the whole a lattice diagram look like, and I'll tell you what I mean by lattice diagram in a second. Um, so here is a, our dear friend, the group, dihedral group of order eight with eight elements. These are symmetries of a square. Uh, topologists call this D4, uh, but algebraists often call that D8. It's, it's generated by two elements, A and B. A is, say, rotation 90 degrees um, counterclockwise of the square, and so A to the fourth is identity, identity is E. B is, uh, is a reflection, maybe the horizontal reflection. And, um, uh, and uh, we have that uh, uh, B squared is E and B A is A cubed B. Now down here, I have all the 
subgroups. These are all, each of these is a subgroup of D8 and it's all the subgroups organized in a particular way. The way it's organized is to say that they are ordered by inclusion. And I will explain that in a second. But for example, the identity subgroup is, is down there at the bottom. Then we have uh, all these uh, subgroups of order two. There is five of them. Um, and, um, and we have A squared. That's, uh, that's also a subgroup of, of order two. Um, we have then the subgroup generated by A. That's a cyclic group of order four. Uh, we have uh, the other subgroups of order four, the ones generated by A squared and B and A squared and AB. Those are not cyclic. That's why they're not generated by just one element. And then we have the full group D8. When we say ordered by inclusion, we mean that uh, we are drawing this as a partially ordered set. Uh, so, uh, so for example, I've drawn a line between an edge between A squared, the subgroup generated by A squared, and the subgroup generated by A because A squared is included, is contained within A. Um, um, and, and the same with uh, the subgroup generated by A squared and subgroup generated by A squared B. There's an edge there because uh, the, the lower group, the one generated by A squared is contained in uh, the higher group, the subgroup generated by A squared B. Um, and, and A squared actually is also contained in that other one. It's contained in those three subgroups of order four. However, uh, I haven't drawn all the inclusions. Like for example, the subgroup generated by A squared is a, sub, is a subgroup of, is contained in D8, but I did not draw a, um, a, an edge between A squared and D8 because it would clutter the issue. And in these kinds of diagrams, we only draw an edge if a, 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 sub, a subgroup is contained in another subgroup and there's no subgroup between them. So, for, so here we can deduce that A squared is a subgroup of D8 by transitivity. A squared is inside A and A is inside D8. And so A squared is inside D8. But we don't draw the inclusions if there is a subgroup between those, those groups. And this is called the Hasse diagram. So, the, so, so to summarize what I just said, the set of subgroups of a group ordered by inclusion, meaning that you think inclusion as a relation on the subgroups, is what's called a partially ordered set or post set. Um, and, and this thing here, the thing that we just were looking at, the diagram we were looking at, is called the Hasse diagram of the post set. And um, with, there's one vertex for each subgroup of G. And if H is a subgroup of K, if K and H, and they're both subgroups of G, so there are two elements of the, in, this, in, the, in this diagram, um, then, um, and if there's, we have the further condition that a K covers H, there's no subgroup L between H and K, then we, we put an edge between uh, going up from H to K. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about post sets or writing down the, um, the exact definition. Um, I urge you to look at my combinatorics talk um, on, on post sets. There's a whole chapter there. The first uh, uh, talk there gives an expansive view of post set. There's another, uh, yes. Um, okay. So, so let's, let's look at this. Subgroups, are, here's a group Q8. Um, it's also a group of order eight, it's not D8. And its subgroup structure actually looks quite different. And um, if we just know this subgroup structure, um, there are things we can, we can say, even if uh, the, the, the definition of the group might not be familiar and I might not know too much about it, there are many things that I can gain from by just looking at the subgroup structure. So for example, I might wanna know what are the elements that commute with this element I? I is one of the generators of the group Q8 and I wanna know what, what uh, um, commutes with that. That's the same as asking what's the centralizer in Q8 of I, and that's what the notation is for the centralizer. Well, any element, uh, uh, so, so this, uh, any element commutes with itself and, and the subgroup generated by I is cyclic, it's an abelian group, and certainly everything in I is gonna commute with I itself. Everything in the subgroup generated by I is gonna commute with I, and the centralizer is a subgroup, we know that, and therefore, uh, what we're going to have is a, um, we are, we're looking for a subgroup. 
And we know that the subgroup generated by I is contained in the centralizer. And we look at the picture, there's only one other subgroup that contains that. And, and, um, uh, and so, so at this point, we just know that this uh, the subgroup generated by I is, uh, is um, contained in the centralizer. But the only other group that contains that is all of Q8. So the only choices are whether or not the centralizer is, is the subgroup generated by I or Q8. But if it was Q8, then that would make I be in the center. Then I would mean that I is commuting with everything. But just from the definition, we know that I and J do not commute, for example, I, J is minus J, I. And so that can't be it. And so we, we conclude without any calculations that the centralizer in Q8 of I is the subgroup generated by I. You might ask, well, what's the center of this group? And, and then the, quest, the answer will be, well, the center of a group is the elements that commute with everything. In particular, it has to commute with I. So it has to be a, a center is also a subgroup, a subgroup contained in I. And those are only I, uh, the subgroup generated by I squared or minus one and the subgroup um, identity. So it's one of those is the center. And we notice that, and, and we can say that with, with, with about the other cyclic groups also. And we notice that um, this subgroup minus one is contained in all of those cyclic groups. And, and every element of a group generates a cyclic group. And this particular um, uh, subgroup is contained in every cyclic group um, that, that's, that, that's generated in this group. And therefore it commutes with every element, it must be in the center. And so we know that this guy is the center. We already discussed that I can't be in the center. If any of the other ones were in the center, then its centralizer would have been the whole group. But, but so the center of um, uh, Q8 is just the, is this, uh, is the subgroup generated by minus one. And so again, we didn't do any calculations and we gleaned some information. This is of course a small enough group that um, even though I gave you sort of a weird uh, definition, you could uh, play around with it and find out what Q is. Q, Q8 is made up of eight elements. You can write them as plus or minus one, plus or minus I, plus or minus J, plus or minus K. And then I squared and J squared and K squared are all minus one. And I, J is K, they, they multiply just like cross products, uh, cross product of vectors in R3 do. Uh, so I, J is K, J, I is um, minus K, J, K is I and K, J and K, I is J and so forth. Um, so you could find this and then answer all your questions because this is a very small group and you could do it directly. But the, this was a proof of concept, the idea that if you know things about the subgroup structure, you can, um, uh, you can assist uh, uh, your work in that. Um, now, if G, and G is a group and H and K are subgroups, then H intersection K is also a subgroup. And in fact, it's the largest subgroup that, that's contained in both H and K. It's contained in H, it's contained in K, and any other subgroup um, that, that's, that's contained in both of them will have to be inside the, the intersection. So intersection is the largest subgroup of G that's contained in both H and K. Likewise, the subgroup generated by H and K is by definition, the smallest subgroup of G that contains both H and K. If you're super lucky, but that's not the case always, this might be H times K. But H times K is not H kind of meaning take elements of H and multiply them by elements of K and look at all those kinds of combinations. But that's not always the case that HK is a group. We'll come back to that in the next lecture. But, um, but, but, the, but whatever H and K are, you look at the smallest subgroup that, uh, um, that's gen that contains both of them and that's the subgroup generated by them. This makes it the fact that any two subgroups have a larger subgroup that's um, contained uh, in both of them and a smaller subgroups that contains them, that makes it um, uh, this uh, lattice, uh, lattice diagram of the subgroups a lattice. I mean, the Hasse diagram of subgroups a lattice. What's a lattice? Um, a partially sort of order set is a lattice. If every pair of elements has a least upper bound, a least upper bound is what um, uh, the subgroup generated by H and K were in our case. A least upper bound means an upper bound, something that's bigger than your two elements. And it's the smallest such thing. And if you have a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound, so that means an element that's 
uh, uh, less than or equal to both elements and is great as such thing, um, then you have a lattice. And, and, and you can just say that every pair of elements have a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound. But by definition of least upper bound and greatest lower bound, um, it, it follows directly that it must, they, those might, must be unique. You can't have two least upper bounds because if you have two least upper bounds, then um, their intersection would be a, uh, um, a, a, even a smaller upper bound. Um, okay. Um, and so instead of talking about the Hasse diagram of the subgroups of G, which is what we do in, in, in combinatorics when we're talking about post sets, we often talk about the lattice diagram of G or lattice diagram of the subgroups of G or lattice of subgroups of G. So the lattice of subgroups of G is, 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 the, is, is what I will be using um, most often to, to talk about the diagrams that we were looking at, those, that, those graphs. There's vertices that are subgroups and edges that show containment, but not all containments, uh, containments that in combinatorics are called cover relations when one element is, is less than or equal to the other, but there's nothing in between. Okay, so, so as, as an example, here's the lattice of subgroups of uh, um, the cyclic group uh, of order two cross cyclic group of order three cross cyclic group of order 47, Z mod two Z cross Z mod three Z cross Z mod 40, 47 Z. This is actually a cyclic group itself. And, and you see that the top group is generated by one element. And, um, and you might like, and for example, here's a containment of the subgroup generated by zero, zero, one is inside the subgroup generated by 0, 1, 1. You might wonder how that is. Well, if you take 0, 1, 1 and raise it to the power 48, but here we are writing things additively, meaning add it to itself 48 times, you will get 0, 0, 1. If you look at these two subgroups, the subgroup generated by 1, 1, 0, and the one generated by 0, 1, 1, you might ask, what is there? Uh, uh, what do they generate? And you just look at the edges and you see where's the first place that they, they come together. Again, this is a lattice. And the, so the subgroup generated by those two things is a unique subgroup. And that's the sub, the whole group here. You might ask, what's their intersection? What's their greatest lower bound? And that's zero, one, zero. Again, you follow through with the edges and you, the first place you get that, can, that from both of them, um, that is the intersection. If you look at these two elements, one, uh, these two subgroups, one zero, the one generated by one zero zero and the one generated by zero one one, you, well, we might ask, what is their intersection? And again, you follow the edges and see where's the first node you get to that's contained in both of them. And in this case, you will see that that intersection is, um, is, is, is just zero, zero, zero. And likewise, you might ask, well, what do they generate? And you see that the first place uh, you get one, one, one. So these two elements, even though they neither one of them generates the group, uh, both of them together do gener generate the group. Again, this uh, diagram does give you information. Now, the way we use these diagrams is not to be, uh, not to say, okay, what are all the informations we can get from the group from the diagram without knowing anything else? We uh, we use a dialectic. We go back and forth between what we know about the specific group and what the diagram tells us. So the diagram will tell us some information, actually will lead us to questions. Then maybe we know something about the group. We, we, we then use that to um, bootstrap what we knew by in, in the diagram uh, to other things and, and, and go back and forth with our, with our knowledge of group theory and the diagram. The diagram is something that will help us in terms of, um, in terms of making arguments. Now, most uh, uh, mathematicians, uh, most group theorists would like you to be able to write a proof without a diagram as well as with a diagram. So without a diagram, if your proof is gonna be right, you should be able to write it without a diagram. But uh, truth be told, uh, most group theorists, when they see an argument, they will have a piece of paper next to them and they will draw a diagram to see what the argument is. And when they're making an argument, they also draw a diagram to make it the argument. But then when they write it up in a research paper, they take the diagrams out often. Okay, so, um, so again, the more we know about a gr group, we can glean more, uh, from, we can, uh, glean, glean more stuff from the lattice diagram. Um, one way to do that is to assign lengths to the edges in the lattice diagram. So if you, in addition to it being a, a, a graph, if you make it a sort of a weighted graph with putting uh, uh, weights on the edges, 
then we actually have more information. And we don't do that willy-nilly. In group theory, we do that in one very specific way. So if uh, the convention that we will use is that if you have a group and you have two subgroups, H and K, and H is S contained in K, then the length of the path from H to K will be the index of K in H. Uh, so that, let me remind you what, what the index of K in H is. That's, uh, if F is finite, that's the number of the right cosets of K in H. If it's not, then it's the cardinality of that. And, um, and, and, and again, if it's finite, it's the length of H divided by length of K. That was basically Rogers' theorem. So, um, so, uh, so, so, so that's what, what we're gonna think of, of the length of the path between H and K. Now, um, uh, the thing to notice is that if G is a finite group and if you have H inside K inside L, H is a subgroup of K, K is a subgroup of L, then um, these indexes multiply. So uh, the index of H in L is the index of K in L times the index of H in K. So um, let's multiply, they don't add. Um, and so uh, in diagram wise, when, when, we, when we draw this, the index of H in K is, is, uh, is uh, the length of the, uh, the, the, the bottom edge. The index of um, uh, K in L is the length of the top edge. But then when, when we multiply them, we get the index of H in L. Now, if H is equal to K, then the length is not zero, it's one. Because again, uh, the number of the uh, right cosets is going to be one. And in fact, that's if and only if the H is equals K, K if um, H is, uh, the index of H and K is one, if that length is one. But we, we put H and K together and we think of that length as one. Um, and usually often we might not know if H and K are the same, so we reserve judgment whether that, uh, that index is one or not. But if it's one, then that means that they're right on top of each other. Also, if we look at identity, which is a subgroup of any subgroup, any, any subgroup or any group, then the index of identity in H is the size of H. So, um, so when you go down all the way to the bottom, you're getting the size of your subgroups. So for example, here's the lattice of subgroups of Zima 27Z, a cyclic group with 27 elements. And, and, and actually the lattice of subgroups is a chain um, uh, it, it's, it's a totally ordered set. So the subgroup generated by zero, the subgroup generated by nine, the subgroup generated by three, those are the only subgroups that we have. For any cyclic group, we have exactly one subgroup of each order dividing the order of the group. But if the, 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 the order of the cyclic group is a power of prime, then that means that uh, we've got this, uh, this chain going up. Um, in, we saw another cyclic group earlier Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 3Z cross Z mod 47Z, which was a cyclic group, but it was not a chain because we had all those different ways of multiplying primes uh, to get subgroups. Okay, so here, for example, that subgroup generated by nine is a subgroup of order three. It consists of zero, nine, and 18. Again, this is Z mod 27Z, so zero through 26 addition mod 27. And so 0, 9, 18 is a subgroup of order three. And, and that three at the bottom is telling us that because that index is the size of, of that group. Also, again, um, uh, indices multiply. So the index of nine in Z mod 27Z is not three plus three, six, it's three times three, nine. And, and the index of um, uh, zero in the subgroup generated by three again is nine. And again, because we're going from identity to the whole group, that's actually telling us what the size of that subgroup is. So the size of that subgroup is nine. And the size of the whole group is 27. Three times three times three is 27. Okay, now um, uh, let's look at uh, our, our final example. Uh, uh, look at the, again, back to our first example, D8, uh, the dihedral group of order eight but with edge lengths and see what we can say just looking at the edge lengths. Now, if this is all you know and you don't wanna do any calculations, you know that these are the sub, someone tells you, some genie tells you that these are the subgroups of D8 and those are the edge lengths, meaning those are the indices, then 
you can do a lot. First of all, you know the order of the group. Two times two times two, you go up a chain. Two times two times two, uh, you get eight. And, uh, and so you know this group has eight elements. And just from um, what we have here, we know that, well, we have got one, two, three, four, five elements of order, um, uh, uh, five elements of order two. Um, and then we have this cyclic group A that's uh, two times two uh, as group of order four um, and, and, and so on. So we, we can say a lot about it. So um, we, we look and see that there's three subgroups of order four. I mean, even if you didn't know what the names of them are, but by the edge lengths, we would know that, I mean, if it's, if, even if the, the genie didn't tell us that this is the subgroup generated by A squared and B and that one is the one generated by A, we would know that their sizes are four. And we know from our group theory that all groups of order four are commutative. In fact, there's only two of them. There's Z mod four Z, the cyclic group of order four and Z mod two Z cross Z mod two Z, the Klein four group. And just looking at these, we see that um, the subgroup generated that middle one must be a cyclic group. I mean, we know that because it's generated by A, but even, as I said, even if I wasn't told that that was generated by that one element, I would know that because when I look at its subgroup structure, I see that it has only one subgroup of order two. Whereas if it was the Klein four group, it would have had three subgroups of order two. Um, and, and so my, uh, when I say is Klein four group, of course, I mean isomorphic to Klein four group. And so uh, this, this group generated by A cannot be the Klein four group just by looking at this picture. Again, even if I didn't know that this was the subgroup generated by A, I would know that this is um, a cyclic group. Whereas the other two are not because they, have the, they do not have the uh, subgroup structure of a cyclic group of order four, but they have the subgroup structure of the Klein four group. So I could tell that right from them. And uh, these subgroups at the bottom are subgroups of order two. A subgroup of order two by nature is cyclic. So they are each generated by one element. So right there, I know that I've got five elements of order two. In fact, every element of order two is gonna give me a different subgroup of order two. So I know this group has five elements of order two. And I had this one cyclic, uh, um, group of order four, and that group is generated by both A and its element. It has two generators. So a cyclic group of order four has two generators because phi of four is two. And, um, and uh, if you know it's the separate group generated by A, well, it's A and A cubed. And so that gives us two other elements. And, and, um, uh, and so five and two is seven, identity is eight. That's all of our elements. So actually, we know what the elements are. There are the five, five elements of order two that generate uh, down here. And then there are two elements of order four and one element of, uh, of, of order one. Now, we might ask, um, and, 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 okay. and we might ask, um, let, let's focus on this, uh, uh, this group down here. Uh, this, this is an element of order two and, and, and ask some questions about it. So for example, we might ask, um, does it commute with the, the, this, this is a group of order two, so it has two elements, E and some other element. That other element is an element of order two. So let's take that element of order two. And I'm asking, does that guy uh, commute with the element of order two that's, a, that's in the subgroup generated by B? And the answer is that, well, these two subgroups together um, uh, I see what their list upper bound is, what the subgroup generated by the two of them is. This is one of the subgroups of order four. It's commutative. They both live inside a commutative group, so they must commute. So A squared commutes with B. And A squared, for the same reason, if you look at this middle dot here, I probably should not have put the names of these because then it would be a little bit more mysterious, but maybe we could have discovered that, that this um, the subgroup also commutes with everything in, in this other one and everything with all, all the other subgroups of order two because, because both they generate together and a, a group of order four, which is abelian by nature. And it's also sitting inside uh, the cyclic group generated by it. And of course it will commute with everything in that same cyclic group. It, a cyclic group is abelian and so forth. So for we just found out that this element is in the center of G without doing any calculations just by seeing where it's sitting in that, in, that, in that picture that's in the center. But could there be something else in the center that we did not notice? For example, could B be in the center? Well, if B is in the center, 
would it commute with AB? Well, we look at the group generated by the two of them and we see that the first group that's, uh, that contains both of them is all of the eight. But we know that two elements of order two that commute should generate a group of order four. If X and Y commute and they're order two, then E, X, Y, and X, Y would be a subgroup of order four. And these guys gave us D8. They're not a subgroup of order. They did not give us subgroup of order four. So they do not commute. So B and AB do not commute. B cannot be in the center um, of, of, of this group. Sa similarly, AB is also not because it doesn't commute with B. And the same thing with A squared B and A cubed B. You can find some other element of order two that um, together they give you D8. We, by the way, we just showed that B and AB also generate the group D8 and B and A cubed B do also, but B and A squared B do not. They generate A squared comma B and in fact, they commute. So all those relations are, are clear from here. Could A be in the center of G? Because A um, um, uh, does commute, I mean, what about A? Well, could A commute with B? Well, uh, the, but A is an element of order four, so I can't use my old argument that two elements of order two um, uh, that commute generated uh, uh, the group of order four. Uh, but if A and B commuted, uh, uh, then, um, then B and AB would commute, uh, but B and AB does not, so B and A cannot commute either. So A is not in the center either, and so we deduce without any calculation that the center of this group is A squared. We could also ask other questions, like for example, let's look at AB and ask what's the centralizer of that. Now, when I say AB, that's one element, the subgroup generated by AB is two elements, E and AB. AB is an element, a, a subgroup uh, a, a element of order two. How do I know that? Oh, because of the edge length. It tells me two down there. Okay, so what is the centralizer of that? Well, of course, it, it commutes with itself. So the subgroup generated by AB, all of it will be in there. Again, because centralizer is a subgroup, if you've got something in there, the whole subgroup generated by AB will be in there. Uh, but the uh, center, the A squared, that will have to be in there. Again, the centralizer as a subgroup will have to contain these two subgroups. And so it will contain um, their, um, the subgroup generated by them, the least upper bound. So, so far we know that the centralizer of AB is the subgroup generated by A squared and AB, but could, be, could it be more? Well, the only subgroup that contains that is all of D8. But could A, B, could that be? Could it be that the centralizer of A, B is all of D8? But that would mean that A, B is in the center and we just proved that the center is just A squared. And so we now know that the centralizer is just that subgroup generated by A squared and A, B. Um, and again, the, the moral of the story is not these arguments because for D8 is small enough group that you could, um, um, not these results because the D8 is small enough group that you could have come up with these things yourself by, by, by some calculations. But the point is that we came up with these with hardly any calculation at all, but as long as we had something that was actually harder to get, which is the whole subgroup structure of the group. And so in the next lecture, we'll talk about how we glean information about groups when we have partial information. And therefore we look at partial lattice diagrams, diagrams where we have maybe just a couple of the subgroups in the group and we draw them in specific ways to, to, to gain as much information as possible. And we use our theory to do that. I urge you uh, to watch uh, the next uh, talk. Till next time.